Many New Testament scholars consider Peter's vision in Acts 10 to be evidence that Luke considered Jewish kosher laws to be abolished. However, Dr. Isaac Oliver, a Jewish scholar who teaches at Bradley University, challenges this interpretation. In his book, Torah Praxis After 70 CE, reading Matthew and Luke Acts as Jewish texts, he argues that the vision is not about the abolishment of kosher laws, but the purification and sanctification of Gentile followers of Jesus. How does he come to this conclusion? That's what we'll talk about here today on Bible History. Read Luke's account of Peter's vision. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Some commentators are quick to interpret the vision as, God declares that Jews no longer need to keep the kosher laws. The Jewish dietary restrictions are now abolished. However, these are not Peter's thoughts. Verse 17 reveals that Peter is completely at loss what to make of the vision. Dr. Oliver comments, Peter's bewilderment signals to Luke's readers that the meaning of the vision must lie elsewhere than a literal application of its stipulations. For Peter, the vision was not about eating unclean animals. The kosher laws were not abolished, but he still does not know the vision's meaning. In verse 17, while Peter ponders this experience, the text says, Suddenly, the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. Oliver points out that this is Luke's way of hinting that the vision is about Jewish-Gentile relations, not about Kashrut. This is evidenced by the fact that the Spirit commands Peter to go with these men, and Peter goes without hesitation. Peter does not go into just any Gentile's home. He goes into the home of Cornelius, who is described as an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Cornelius is a God-fearer, meaning that he is one who worships the God of Israel, attends the local synagogue, and his home was one that was sensitive to Judaism, as he even observed some Jewish practices. Luke's informed readers know that by entering Cornelius' home, there was no risk of being served unkosher food. It is when Peter is in Cornelius' home, standing before a group of Gentiles, that he is able to explain the meaning of his vision. In Acts 10.28, he says, you are all well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call any one profane or unclean. First, it is important to recognize that when Peter says our law, he does not mean the Torah prohibited Jewish people to be in contact with Gentiles or come into their homes. There's no such command found in Torah. In fact, we have examples in ancient Jewish literature of Jews and Gentiles eating together. The Greek word used in Acts 10.28 to associate is kolosthai, and as Oliver explains, Luke seems to address the Jewish concern over food served over extended, intimate association and interaction with non-Jews. One reason for thinking this is that kolosthai is used in Acts 5 verse 13 to describe those who refuse to join the Jesus movement. Joining this movement was more than saying, I believe in Jesus. It involved becoming part of a community, becoming fully integrated, sharing bread daily, and distributing common goods. For Peter, the problem is not whether he can share a meal with Cornelius. The issue is whether he can enter into this intimate association with him as a Gentile. Can Cornelius join the Jesus movement even though he is a Gentile? Peter provides the true meaning of the vision when he says, God has shown me that I should not call any one profane or unclean. The profane and unclean animals in the vision are what represent what Peter considered to be profane and unclean Gentiles. The way Peter and some other Jews view Gentiles is found in the Jewish historian Josephus, who is writing in the late first century CE. He explains that during the Second Temple period, Gentiles were only allowed access to the temple's outermost court. Oliver writes, A spectrum of profaneness, sanctity, 
ranging from the most profane of persons, Gentiles, to the holiest of individuals, the Jewish high priest, defined and governed relationships between Jews and Gentiles in such spaces and other venues. The reason Gentiles were excluded from entering the temple was because they were considered to be an intrinsically profane people. Reading Peter's statement, God has shown me that I should not call any one profane or unclean, in its Jewish context makes all the difference. We can now understand this explanation. Dr. Oliver explains, the vision is about the purification and sanctification of Gentile believers. Luke is simply stating that Gentile followers of Jesus, not all Gentiles, are no longer to be avoided, for they have abandoned their sinful ways and now worship the God of Israel. This interpretation is supported by Acts 10 verse 34, when Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. An additional point that Oliver highlights that I think is worth discussing is Peter's report to the Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. In Acts 11 verse 3, they are concerned not what Peter eats, but with whom he eats. Oliver captures Peter's reaction so well. He writes, Luke claims that the Jewish followers in Jerusalem rejoiced not because of Peter's first taste of bacon, but because God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. To conclude, Oliver's argument is that Peter's vision in Acts 10 is not about food laws. What God reveals to Peter in his visit to Cornelius' home is the true meaning of the vision. Gentiles who leave their immoral practices behind, submit to Israel's God and Jesus' lordship, are no longer profane. They can join and should join the Jesus movement, participating in Judaism, because God has purified them as Gentiles. Oliver does emphasize that Luke maintains the distinctions between the Jewish and Gentile wings of the Jesus movement. While Jews are still expected to maintain a kosher diet, remaining Torah observant, Gentiles are not under the same requirement. They should enter the Jesus movement as Gentiles. I find Dr. Oliver's argument persuasive, but I really want to know what you think. So please let me know in the comments whether you agree or whether you disagree. If you found this video helpful, enlightening, or challenging, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you would like to support us, please do so through Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below. Thank you again and see you next time on Bible History.